usually these disorders are not well known by neurologists. So in our experience, most of these patients come with an unknown or unexplained neurological disease. And this is perhaps the most important red flag. A patient with a neurological disease, a true neurological disorder, but without a defined diagnosis because it does not, um, it is not like other neurological disease or it, does not, it is not similar to other neurological disease. So this is the first point. The other thing is that um, there are some specific patterns that suggest this kind of disease. Usually when the patient present with neurological and psychiatric, psychiatric disorders, but uh, with other uh, uh, involvements like uh, involvement of the eyes, of the liver, or uh, other any uh, organic disease that is not related to the uh, neurology. And this is caused by the fact that metabolism is a diffuse um, thing. It happens in all the cells. So usually when you have a metabolic disease, it, has, it does not only involve a small part of the nervous system, but it usually involves the, the, the whole body. And this is not something which is important. It is the association of uh, or an unusual association of a neurological disease plus another organic disorder, like an eye problem or other kind of disease. There are other red flags, like for example, the fact that some of these disorders may decompensate in certain situations. It is not true for all the metabolic disease, but for some of them, there are some triggering factors, especially in the adult population. If the patient has lived into the adult age, it's because he don't, doesn't have a very a so severe metabolic disease. And then the disease might decompensate, for example, after fever, after surgical uh, procedure after certain drugs and this is also something very important the, the notion of a triggering factor and um, perhaps another thing is that uh, some of these disorders are all of them are genetic but uh, they are uh, inherited as a recessive uh, disease meaning that the parents are usually not involved and uh, the, the children or the, the adult will have uh, this kind of disease and eventually one sib in the family might have the same disease. So it's not always the case, especially in the small families like uh, in Western Europe, but uh, if you have a lot of children in the same, uh, in the same uh, uh, sib pair, then you, you may have uh, another patient with the same kind of uh, uh, disorders. So this might be also uh, something that can be considered as a red flag. The problem with Neiman Peak Type C is that the, the presentation in adulthood might be very non-specific. Basically, there are three main types of presentation. Patients with present with psychiatric signs, meaning an atypical psychosis, or sometimes it can be quite typical. The other situation is a patient with a cerebellar ataxia, and the, the third one is a patient with early onset dementia. So this is very unspecific, and there are many other disorders that can present the same way. The fact is that there are very specific signs that may help a clinician to suspect NPC. One of these signs is the vertical supranuclear gaze palsy, which is extremely specific for this disease. But the fact is that most of the patients are not recognized with this sign because you have to look very carefully, especially for the rapid eye movements. If you only make the slow pursuit, you may totally overlook this sign because uh, it's not obvious and the slow pursuit can be totally normal. So in these patients, it's very important to um, search for the rapid eye movements that are called the saccades and here you will see that there is an impairment of the vertical saccades and it is extremely specific and very sensitive for the diagnosis of NPC. Miglustat treatment is not supposed to cure the patient or to reverse the existing neurological symptoms but uh, there are some symptoms that can improve very much for uh, uh, with uh, Zaveska. One of these symptoms are the psychiatric disorders and in our experience patients with these uh, symptoms may improve with time. Another symptom that can improve uh, is the dysphagia and most of the patients with dysphagia don't have any uh, more dysphagia when they are treated with Zaveska. The fact is that the treatment is not uh, very rapidly uh, efficient and we have to wait for a time, for a while 
before uh, seeing the, the, the improvement of in this patient. And this delay can be quite long with some patients that start to improve after several months or even a year. The other thing is that even if it does not improve the symptoms, uh, Zaviska might slow down or even halt the disease progression. So for the very long term, we see rather a slowdown of the disease, but uh, during the first years of treatment, there can be a, a total arrest of, of the disease. We don't have enough experience to, to say what will happen within 10 or 20 years of treatment, but we know that it slows down. So this is the, the most important thing. I think it can take a long time, and in our experience in 15 patients or so, uh, we observed that uh, in most patients, uh, uh, we were really convinced that the treatment was efficient after two, three years of treatment, because at the beginning it's not very obvious, because the treatment is not supposed to act very rapidly. And one very good example is uh, uh, NMR spectroscopy. When we follow this patient with NMR spectroscopy, we can see a normalization of the choline on NA ratio after about 12 or 18 months of treatment. But before this period, we don't see any change. It means that probably the effect of the treatment is really a long-term effect that needs several months or several years to, before uh, having profound effect on the storage of uh, uh, lipids in the brain.